My goodness, you're handsome. Oh, <laughs> I was talking about the truck. Welcome to part two of our Holley EFI Terminator X Max Stealth install. In part one, we got quite a bit done. If you're interested, go back and check that out. Fuel tank installed, throttle body plopped on there. Some of the hardware mounted, not all, but some. And I've got a long list of things that is, that's left to do. In fact, I just got done making the list. So let me show you that. We'll start checking them off one at a time, get closer to finished, maybe even finished, if we're lucky. We're not gonna get finished, but we'll try. So let me show you the list and we'll start checking them off. We got a lot to do. So here's the list of things that I gotta do. I got 15 items on this, and these are just the things that come to mind. This is not, oh, this is not all of it. So we got mount the coil. I just now made my coil wire. At least I put the end on it that I need. I don't know exactly how long it's gotta be yet. We've got uh, oil or wire sending unit, hook up the fuel lines and flush, install a relay for my oil or my fuel pump circuit. I decided I'm going to do that. Uh, hook up my vacuum lines, power CD, CDI box, on and on and on. Lots of stuff to do. So let's just pick something. Let's just start off with number one, mount the coil, and then uh, we'll keep on moving down the list, or we'll do random things that we want to first and save the things that we despise to the very last. So let's talk about relays for just a second. I'm going to install a relay on my fuel pump power wire so I can eliminate the need for the ECU or the computer of this Holly Terminator X Max Stealth system to have all that excess current running through it. Holly recommends that if you're running a fuel pump, an electric fuel pump that's over 15 amps, that you do this anyway. Now my fuel pump's not over 15 amps, but just to be safe, keep the current draw on the ECU down and let the relay do the hard work. That's why that's why we're gonna install one. We'll let it burn up if something happens and save the ECU and just use the power wire that comes from it for a signal instead of one that carries the entire load. It'll make more sense when I show you the relay and we discuss what's gonna go on. We'll make it quick, but that's what I'm gonna do. Install a relay in my fuel pump power wire. So I've got a small automotive electrical diagnostics tool here and it's got a built-in relay checker. You can do the same thing on the bench with a power source and a voltmeter. We're just going to mimic a signal and then check a connection is all we're going to do. So we've got a four post relay here. So between posts 85 and 86 is a small coil that when energized closes a switch. That's all it does. And it's got our posts labeled on the front here so we know where are we to put our power. So I'm going to mimic a signal using this small electrical unit here and I'll show you exactly what's going on because it displays an image on the screen. So we're going to hook up our what would be our signal 85 and 86. Get it in there. And then we've got our what will be the power wires that run from one will run from the battery to here and then from here to the fuel pump to the 12 volt supply of the fuel pump so this will do the heavy load switching and not the ecu so let's activate this when i push this button here it'll send a signal 12 volts actually through the coil in this and it'll show us whether the switch is closing or not we can just test it to see if it works and get a good visual of what's going on let me zoom you down on the screen you'll see so there's a display of our four post relay. You can see we've got a little coil between 85 and 86, and then our switching's gonna do between, it's gonna happen between 87 and 30. And when I push this up button, it's actually gonna energize this coil, and you should see a little red bar connect posts 87 and 30. So we'll power it. Yeah, I can feel it clicking. I can hear it clicking. You can see that little red line. When I let off, it opens back up and that's all it's doing. So we'll use our ECU power just to control this small draw current, small current draw coil, and then we'll let this actually do the switching of the power, carry the load. Does that make sense? I hope so. Pretty simple. So there's just no great place to mount this coil. I have been battling this for a little while, putting it off, going, moving on to something else, and it's time that I just find a place to put this thing. So no good flat surface anywhere. I thought about mounting it maybe to a valve cover, but then I didn't want the heat 
you know, make, welding the bracket on, mounting it bump to a valve cover. Wouldn't look bad, but I don't know about that. So I'm gonna mount this right here. How am I gonna mount that here? And there's no place to mount it? Oh gosh, just throw that down. Um, did I break it? No, thankfully. Um, I'm gonna put a plate here, extend it down, and mount this to the plate. That's what I'm gonna do. So here's how this is gonna work. I'm gonna mount this to the firewall. It'll just have two bolts holding it together. But in, to keep this from flexing like that and not looking like it's fully mounted, I've got a little piece of carbon fiber here that I had that was about the right size. I drilled a few holes in it. And now when I use some nut certs to bolt this to the firewall, it'll spread that load out and keep it from flexing on this ear and breaking off. At least that's the way I think that it will work. And it'll have four bolts in it. It'll look, look clean and you know should, uh, should hold, I think. It wouldn't hold if you didn't use some good nut certs, though. That sheet metal's not very thick. These things really help spread the load out. So got my fuel pump relay mounted right behind the brake booster. Now this white wire, gosh, there's a bunch of wires. This white wire is now going to run from the power, the ECU, the power to the, from that is supposed to operate the fuel pump is now just going to trigger it through this white wire. And then the power will actually come through this wire from the battery through the gate in the relay and then back to the fuel pump. I thought you were out there barking at something. She smells like a skunk now. Cora, just a little, but there must be a skunk out there. What are you doing? So I know this looks like chaos. It really does. And sometimes it feels like chaos with all these, you know, everywhere. And I've been told I have issue many times by teachers focusing on one thing. Think about the math problem, not what you're doing at home this afternoon or having for supper. And uh, if you can make yourself focus on one thing at a time, all of this comes together in the end, and it's really not that bad. Wiring is one of those things I'm not great at, although it, it takes just an enormous amount of time to run wires in what I would consider a proper way. And when done right, no one even notices it but they do notice it if you do it wrong. So I'm cleaning off a spot for a ground. Grounds are just as important as your good connections on your power wires. Remember that. Always, always make sure that you got good grounds. So I'm cleaning off the paint here. Got a little star washer. You see these used a lot. A little star washer. So it bites in really good. And I'm making a ground connection here for this relay. Needs to be a good one. So here's a look at the grommets that I'm using. Anywhere where I'm running wires through sheet metal. Man, I don't want it to rub onto the wires and burn down my shop or my truck or cook my electronics well worth the extra time to uh, install these wherever wherever they're needed. This kit come from Harbor Freight, I think. 
170 piece rubber grommet assortment. Pretty good actually. And then for the big bulkhead main harness through the firewall, I had to pick these up individually. Not individually, but I had to order these off Amazon. It's like less than 10 bucks for four. So you just cut it to the size of the wires that are going through there and jam her in. So it makes the install so much nicer when you're when you use grommets and stuff. Get a little peace of mind. So it is optional to not have to run the large wiring harness for this thing through the firewall. I just chose to do that because I wanted the ECU or the sensitive computer box to be mounted out of the weather, inside the truck where it's more protected. You could mount it on a fender well. It's considered to be uh, splash resistant, I guess. But I just chose to run it through and uh, try to keep the install looking a little more clean and less clutter, uh, as little clutter as possible inside the actual engine bay. I love the extensions that have the knurled section on them so you can grab onto them, spin them with your hands. Makes it nice. So if you didn't watch part one of this install, you may not know that I installed a complete fuel tank, in tank pump, uh, sending unit, all that stuff. So no need for this mechanical fuel pump, which I'm removing right now. Um, I just decided to delete the fuel pump altogether the mechanical one, put it on a block off plate. Why have it there? Right? It's no longer needed. So it's now time to install the O2 sensor. This is a Bosch 49 wideband O2. Really nice sensor. I've already got one of these installed in the driver's bank for my standalone AFR gauge that some of you may have watched me install sometime back. And I used the information that I gathered from that uh, standalone uh, air fuel ratio gauge to determine what jets and stuff I needed to put in the carburetor. Basically this for that Holly system that I'm putting in is going to do the same thing except the computer is going to make changes based on the information that it gets from this and not necessarily me. Now I can go in the software and make changes on my own but this thing's job is to sniff the exhaust and tell the computer what to do. So I've already got the one in the driver's bank, same one. We're going to install this one in the passenger bank. I've got a kind of a problem, but I, and I'll explain that in just a second. 18 by 1.5, if I remember correctly, is the thread pitch on these. I've, I've got the bung here. This is what they send with the kit that you weld into the exhaust, and then just screw your sensor in. So the problem that I've run into is that the sensor wire on the main Holly EFI harness that plugs into the O2 sensor that I'm about to weld in, it's really short. In fact, it's way too short to get to where I want to put the O2 sensor in the driver's or in the passenger bank. Seeing as I already have one in the driver's bank, that's a little that can be because of just the where everything's at on the truck. It's a little closer. I'm going to use the driver's bank to tie into the Holly system, and then because I've got plenty of excess cable with my standalone gauge, I'm going to use it on the passenger bank. <clears throat> Just got to swap some wires around, really. That, that's all it is. Another thing that's pretty important is that we make sure that all of our sensitive electronics are unhooked before we start welding on this truck. Because now we've got a sensitive computer in here that doesn't like spikes and voltage. And welding can cause all sorts of problems with electric vehicles. Ask me how I know. I've seen that a bunch. People cooking the computers and stuff in them, welding on them. So if you can unhook everything, that's a good idea. I'm not telling you what to do. You can sometimes get away with it and get lucky, but it's a good idea to unhook everything before you start welding on exhaust or any part of the vehicle. Make sure your ground clamp is directly hooked as close as you can to what you're welding, which is a good idea anyway. So that's what we're gonna do. We are gonna install an O2 sensor in the passenger bank. So that's welded in. Man, it's a pain. This really should be MIG welded. 
it's hard to get in there with the TIG. But it's good. Should be leak free. We got it all the way around. It's facing up a little bit, like the manual says. I think we're good. Not the most beautiful weld, that's for sure. It don't have to be. So now that I've got the exhaust all hooked up, both oxygen sensors are connected. Now I'm going to move on to the coil. Now they produce a ton of RF, radio frequency or noise. Sensitive electronics do not like that kind of stuff. It can cause all kinds of chaos. So these wires that power this need to be ran by themselves, basically. And you don't want any of your wires to your sensitive electronics laying over your spark plug wires, coil wires. This thing's constantly building and collapsing a magnetic field, and it just makes a ton of noise. So I picked up all of my wiring supplies off of Amazon, just the, some of the cheap stuff. Got decent connectors, the heat shrink type, that when you apply heat to them, they shrink, and then they, they glue the wires on the ends. I like those. Helps them to, to not pull free. And then the tape that I'm using is some that I'd showed some time back. It's Tessa brand tape, made in Germany, used on some of the more high-class cars. Got a really nice fabric feel to it. Good professional look. Just prefer it. Uh, anywhere wires are going to be seen over your standard electrical tape. And all the stuff I picked up is reasonably priced, no more than you know, any of the other stuff that you'd buy. So I am super close. Now, just doing some of the final things before I try to hit the key on this thing for the first time and see what she does. Oh, I gotta program the wizard and a few more things, but you get the idea. All of the wiring, all hooked up. Uh, right now, I need to flush the fuel line because I cut this fuel line a couple times, put in a new uh, uh, pressure sending unit or a fuel pressure regulator. It's a good idea, I think, to flush all that. I've got a fuel filter in line, but still, I wanna flush all that before I hook it up to the throttle body and contaminate those injectors. I'd rather just blast any debris into a fuel jug. So what I'm doing, I unplugged my fuel pump relay that I installed earlier, and I'm just gonna bypass that all together, 12 volts from the battery right here. And we're just gonna go down to the power wire that feeds the pump. That'll supply 12 volts, bypassing the relay straight to the pump. It'll kick it on and then my fuel line is in this jug. So it should, in theory, if it works, just pump fuel in the jug, and flush the line. Wow, that was fast. Okay, that's good enough. Flushed. I can hook all this back up and uh, sync the dis distributor and play with the wizard and we'll be trying to fire this thing up for long. I hooked the fuel line up to the throttle body. Now it's time to hot wire the pump again, now that it's a closed loop. Crawl up under the truck, see what the gauge says on the fuel pressure regulator and adjust, if it, adjust it if it's needed. It needs to be 60 PSI, says the tech, for this system to work properly. So let's hot wire the pump, I'll take you with me. We'll crawl up under here, we'll set the fuel pressure to 60 PSI, do a quick leak check, and then after that, the fuel loop, everything is done. We're getting close. Sneak up under here and see what it says. Oh wow, it's already right at 60. Yeah. See, we can adjust it, lower the pressure, 40 PSI, raise it to 60. There we go. We'll lock it down. That should be good. Let's 
see any leaks. There we go. 60 PSI. So it is time for what I'm going to consider a little bit of payoff. I've hooked up the battery. The truck doesn't send up any smoke signals, so that's good. Um, I just want to see the little handheld screen power up. I want to see the ECU power up. My wiring is not done. Everything's hooked up. It's just not concealed and zip tied exactly the way that it's going to be. But it is good enough for me to power this thing up, uh, sink in the distributor, just see something happen after two days worth of work. So let's go to the cab, turn the key, see if we get power in there. We should. Let's see if it happens. All right, so it says initial power up. Turn the ignition key to the run position. This should apply power to the ECU as well as the Terminator X handheld control module. That's what that's called. Um, the handheld should power up and the home screen, figure 38, should appear. The home screen contains icons which will navigate to different functions and features of the 3.5 inch touch screen. These features will be discussed in detail throughout this manual. So, let me grab my keys and then we'll power this thing up. I'm just hoping that we don't experience an arc flash. All right, what does that mean? TPS, that's not the home screen. Perform a TPS auto reset before startup. Wizard TPS auto reset, okay. What does that mean? I'll have to read and find out. Well, that looks pretty cool, actually. Got lights going on in the ECU. Very satisfying, I will have to admit. Very satisfying. So, it's got power. Now, let me read through this and we'll decide what to, what to do next. So what I'm doing is configuring the ECU to the setup that I have. So we've got a throttle body injection, next. Uh, we are the four injector, the Terminator X, next. A number of cylinders, eight. Next, uh, we're going to go Imperial measurements. Next, uh, our engine displacement will be 383. Okay, next, target idle speed, let's say 750. 770, that's, that's okay. Next, uh, cam, we've got like street strip, I guess. Pretty big cam, but not like crazy race. Next, the ignition type. Ignition type. We've got the Holly dual sink right there. Holly dual sink, next. Fuel pressure, 60 PSI, next. Power adder, we have none, next. Uh, map sensor, we've got the internal, next. I guess now I'll start? Not for sure. Need to read a little more before I commit. So it's asking me to do a throttle position uh, auto set, which requires me to make sure, it requires me to push the gas pedal down and let it up and down and let it up. That's what it does. Make sure the ignition on and it's not started, start. Slowly press the pedal to the floor, then slowly release, do this twice. Slowly press the pedal to the floor. Release, slowly press to the floor. And release. Okay, next. Says it was successful. Done. All right, this is uh, moving right along. 
So I'm getting super, super close. Goodness gracious, this is a big install. I've had a great time doing it, I will say that, but it, it's not simply just plugging in plugs and you're off to the races. There, there is more to it, and you can make it as, as complicated as you want because these kits are very customizable, and that's what is appealing to me about this is its ability to be changed. In the future, I can add on sensors and stuff if I want. Uh, it's very versatile, so, but that also, like I say, makes it uh, a bit complicated. And it's, some of this is a little outside of my comfort zone, like the electronic stuff. Got a hair in my mouth. Sorry. Some of it's a little outside of my comfort zone, uh, which is, I guess, a good thing because that's where you where you learn. But it's also a bit uh, uncomfortable because it's outside of my comfort zone uh, because there's always risk of making mistakes and messing things up. But the good thing about Holly is that their customer service. I've called them a, I think two two times so far. Sometimes it takes. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes to get through to somebody, but when you do, those their tech people are awesome. Um, both people I've talked to knew exactly what I should do. Um, I just you know, had my stuff in front of me and explained to them and they were very good. So that is a good thing to have quality customer support when it comes to a kit like this because there are a few ways to do it right and there's lots of ways to, to do it wrong. Um, so instead of me showing you all that I've done as far as the work, because that's hours of pulling wire and making connections and it's boring, I'm just going to walk you around and show you uh, what I, all I've been into. And then we'll phase this distributor because I think it phases in a neat way, one that I've personally never dealt with before. And then um, we should be just about ready to fire this thing up. So let me, uh, let me grab the camera, I'll show you what I've been doing and then... Uh, and then maybe we'll hear this thing make some noise, hopefully. So let's take just a second and talk about the wiring of this kit, because man, that's the hardest part of this entire install. And Holly is very particular, and these kits are very particular, on where you pull your power from. If it says run your wires straight to the battery, well then don't run it to a you know, starter solenoid and say, well, that's got 12 volts on it, that's good enough. Don't do that run it directly to the battery. Battery acts like a big buffer or, or filter. and You're gonna get your cleanest power from the battery posts. If you could get a dual post battery and uh, pull off the side post, that'd be even better. Uh, but let's say you don't have a clean 12 volt source. In this truck, over by the ignition, or over by the ECU, there's one wire that's red and pink, pink and blue, or pink and white. Maybe it's even red, I'm not sure, red and white. It specifies in the manual, it needs to be a clean 12 volt source that's hot with the ignition on and while cranking. Well, I, there's not even such a thing on this truck that I can tell, or that I trust anyway. So what I did to, to make sure that I had the cleanest 12 volts run into that wire as possible is I ran power from the battery through a relay into, the, into that small wire and I used the switched 12 volt ignition source that all of these, or 12 volt source that powers the ignition that all of these old GMs had. One rig red wire that runs into the HEI. Well, that's hot with ignition on and while cranking. What I did is I just took it and put a splitter in it. One powers my ignition, the other runs to a relay, triggers it, supplies 12 volts from the battery, into that wire. That's the way I got the cleanest 12 volts that I could get. So hopefully that works. And if you're looking for a clean 12 volt source that's hot while cranking, ah, good luck, because uh, I don't know if they exist on these old things. You may have to make your own like I did. Wire you up a relay for, for post relay. Use your ignition, dirty ignition wire to power a 12 volt relay and you know just run straight from the battery in. So hopefully that works. I think that it should. Uh, you know that's just the way I did it we'll see it doesn't look bad there's not it's not like there's a ton more wiring on this thing even though there is if you take your time and do some hiding it, it, it doesn't look like a spaghetti mess which is a really good thing Holly does a pretty good job of giving you plenty of wire to uh, route route them in a way that is uh, inconspicuous I like that the harness was plenty long in my case and uh, you know, everything was routed, I thought, in a uh, very sensible way. Now, 
One thing that I had to do is tie in to the main harness. I had to, which I forgot to do before I pulled the harness through the firewall. I had to run an extra wire in my harness because there's several customizable inputs and outputs on the computer of this where you can assign them for different things. Let's say you want a couple of pressure transducers in places like, like me. Uh, I've got one right here for the fuel system, but that was already wired in to the main ECU. I didn't have to do anything other than plug that in, but I wanted a second pressure transducer, one for oil pressure. Now I've got the old school uh, oil pressure sending unit on there and my manual gauge uh, will still work but I put a Y in my oil pressure tap and I screwed in another one you probably can't see it back there uh, of these 0 to 100 psi pressure transducers and I had to custom wire that into the main harness so Holly sells these uh, add-on kits that already come pre-crimped with the proper ends on them and you just plug these in depending on what you're going to do to the plug on the main harness that goes into the ECU and then you just run your wire to the harness or to the sensor that you're going to do and uh, there you go so very customizable I had to pull a sensor wire from pin 20 of the main ECU and then I opted to cut off this was an optional plug that was in the main harness uh, to, for an external map sensor. Well, I'm using the internal map sensor that came with the Holly ECU, which is a one bar sensor, because I'm not using boost. I don't have a turbocharger, I don't have a supercharger, none of that. So I did not need anything other than the single uh, map sensor that's already in there. So I cut this off. I used the sensor ground and the plus five volts. I used those two wires from th this non-use sensor to power and ground my uh, secondary pressure transducer that I wired in and all I did was pull the sense wire to pin 20 on the main harness. I, hope, I know that's probably more information than you want to know but I'm just saying that if you were to do a kit like this and you wanted a second transducer and your harness didn't have one, long as there's open spots available, inputs and outputs, you know, you can do that kind of stuff, which is very, uh, very nice. So let me show you. I'll give you a, just a quick idea of what I did there uh, inside the truck because I got the ECU pulled out at the moment. And uh, then we'll start phasing that distributor. So you can see I've got the inside of the truck all blown apart here. Uh, if you watched the first install video that I did, part one of this, you'll know I mounted my ECU in the glove box here. Cut some holes in the bottom to run my wires through. I just thought that that was a good place to mount this out of the way uh, still being able to open this thing up t to monitor any of the LEDs if that's ever needed uh, for the ECU so here's the main harness got it ran through and this is the plug that I added the extra sense wire to for my extra oil pressure sender unit that's a, it's just electronic unit that sends a signal into the ECU that and the ECU converts that through a 5 volt signal into a, a reading on a gauge basically it's electronic uh, electronic gauge uh, uh, simply so I had to add a wire for the sense so it knows what signal to this plug which I had to add in pin hole 20 and these are really easy to add uh, extra wires to I was kind of confused the first time I looked at it then I decided probably look at the instructions uh, all you have to do to add an extra plug into one of these if you have open spots like I do you can see they got a little white block offs I don't know if you can see that from there or not but little white uh, uh, block offs that for the ones that aren't used you just grab those with the needle nose pliers pull it out take a flat blade screwdriver push uh, in that white bar there and that unlocks all of the connectors then you just as while it's unlocked just stab in your new wire push it in from the top it relocks and boom you've added an extra wire to your harness and uh, it's super simple no and in the case of the harness that they sell it's like I mentioned it's already got the little plugs on it so 558-420 I think was the part number whatever you get it plenty of wire there too so added that in ran it into the loom which is you just fold it open shove a wire in I taped it up yeah, you get the idea and there we go now we've got a 
sense wire into the location that is already programmed in the Holly software, in my case, for an oil pressure sender unit. So I should, after I pulled the plus five volts in the uh, sense ground from that external map sensor that I'm not using to power and ground my sensor, I should have an oil pressure signal coming into the ECU now. So no, I didn't need to program that uh, in the software and use one of my inputs and outputs when it was already configured. Holly just did not run the wire for it because, and I understand why they do that, because imagine if they ran all of those extra wires in every kit, it would add a lot of expense to the harnesses and probably a lot of people are not gonna use all of those inputs and outputs that this thing's capable of. So they just sell the extra wire that you stab into the back of your connector and run yourself. It's not as complicated as it seems. What we are gonna do is phase this distributor, make the lights come on when they should, and that's gonna be dependent on, uh, the way that we turn it is gonna be dependent on our rotor rotation. Small blocks, big blocks, Chevy, clockwise rotation. Fords and stuff, Chryslers, I think those are all counterclockwise, so. Anyway, let's get up under this hood. I've got the distributor cap off. I've got the ignition on. And let's tweak the base of this distributor so it's pretty much where it should be. And hopefully, then, we will crank the ignition and see where we're at as far as timing. It should read 15 degrees. So I dropped my distributor down into the engine where the rotor button, the electrode on the rotor button, is pointing toward my number one cylinder. And in the manual, it says for engines that have a rotor rotating clockwise, which uh, this one is, turn the housing until the rotor contact is pointed at the black crank position sensor. And, and that, where is that? Okay, that is this little dude right there at that bolt. Okay. So now it says both the cam and the crank LED should be illuminated, and they are. We've got two little, uh, two little lights there. Now it says slowly turn the housing clockwise until the crank LED goes off. Clockwise until the crank LED goes off. Slowly. Beep. There we go. It's off. And then it says, then slowly turn the housing counterclockwise clockwise, until the crank LED comes back on. Okay. Stop at this point. This will position the distributor close to where it needs to be. Install, snug the distributor clamp down at this point. Okay, that's it. That was easy enough. Not hard at all to phase in. So something that I thought was a bit out of the ordinary was they ask you to bring your number one cylinder up on compression and stop at 50 degrees before top dead center before sinking this distributor. I'd never had to do that before. I thought that was just a bit odd, but that's what they say to do. All right, so after every bit of two full days of work installing this kit, it is time for the moment of truth, and that is will it fire up. My only concern at the moment is that this timing light is absolute garbage and I can't 100% verify that I'm where I should be on timing, but I think that I am. I've got a better one at my dad's that I'm going to pick up, but that's not going to stop me from trying to see if this thing will run because it will or it won't. So I'm going to hook my laptop up. Maybe when it's running, this timing light will work better, but just cranking it, it doesn't work very well. So I'm gonna hook my laptop up and we'll see if this thing starts up. It's exciting. All right. Is this thing gonna, gonna run? fired right up. Oh man. Idle's a little high.
that thing fired it had to crank a little bit to get the air out of the injectors I'm sure but man never touched the gas nothing I'm not used to that I'd still be sitting in there feathering the gas That is so awesome. I can't get over how good this thing runs just right off the bat. Let me show you where I mounted just temporarily the little uh, three and a half inch screen. Just it's just two sided taped. The little holder is to uh, the dash right there. Just for now, this does not have to stay in the vehicle. And then I've got my laptop in here just for uh, more in depth tuning and uh, watching parameters that are hard to see on that little screen. So we've got our uh, USB link ran through the uh, ashtray, and all I gotta do is unplug my USB port, roll up the cord, stick it in the ashtray, completely hidden. So let's fire this thing up and take a ride in it. Okay, so this is not a cold start. It's, it's kind of warm. a self-learning system so they will self-tune uh, to a certain degree now that doesn't take the place of a uh, qualified tuner uh, filling in all the spots that either the computer doesn't isn't able to or uh, just uh, things that uh, bug you about the way that it runs cold starts hot starts whatever um, that stuff has to be addressed by someone who is a tuner let's just say the wizard or whatever the base calibration is just to get you onto the road maybe onto the trailer and then uh, to the tuner so surprised that it runs as good as it does I got a couple little lean spots that I'm hoping will, this thing will learn its way out of um, and uh, I'm fully intent on diving into the software uh, learning as much as I can uh, on my own but super happy with this thing it I can't I can't say good enough stuff about it uh, at this point anyway I'm super shocked that it runs as good as it does just with a few pushes of a of some buttons so this thing's awesome
right guys, so that's it this week. Hopefully me showing myself installing this gives somebody the encouragement that they need uh, to maybe tackle something like this on their own. You do not have to know everything that's involved in a kit like this to be successful. All that you have to have is the willingness to read the manual, maybe make a few phone calls, take your time, and I think about anybody uh, that has the basic knowledge of this stuff could, could be successful on it. Um, it's the first install that I've ever done on one of these, and I would consider it a complete success. So I guess that's it for this week. I got a really neat machining job coming up next week that I think a lot of you guys will enjoy, and I'm looking forward to getting started on that. So that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who's helped me out whatsoever, it is much appreciated. And that is it. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.